Well, to discuss this further, I'm joined from Yerevan by Richard Geragosian. He is the founding director of the Regional Studies Center, an independent think tank based in Armenia's capital. From Washington, D.C., Philip Gamagalian. He is a lecturer in the Justice and Peace Program at Georgetown University. And completing our panel from Montreal, Canada, is journalist Levon Sevunz. He's been following Pashinian's progress for the past decade now. Thanks all so much for joining us on the Newsmakers. Richard Garagosi, and I have to start with you because you said very clearly the last time we spoke that these protests wouldn't really amount to much and nothing would really change in Armenia. And within about 48 hours, Sar Sarkisian actually resigned. How did you and our other panelists at the time, to be fair, get it so wrong? Well, in many ways, it was both sudden and an abrupt resignation by the former president turned prime minister. That was also the tipping point. What we see today, however, is that was perhaps the easy part. Now we are in a much more challenging period of systemic change, bringing to bear pressure on the ruling Republican Party, which, like the former president, has been in, par in power for too long, over a decade. And this is where the political arithmetic, the calculus of political change, really comes in. But you're right, many of us were caught off guard, and we underestimated the momentum and the demand for change in Armenia. Levan Savuns, did you see the same thing coming? Were you expecting this dramatic change, or did you feel that these protests really couldn't move much in what a political system that was so entrenched in Armenia? I, I, I would have to admit uh, I was quite surprised by how quickly and uh, the protests uh, gathered momentum. I mean, he started, um, uh, Nikol Pashinyan started his walk, his now famous walk, as a single person. By the time he got to Montreal after vis uh, sorry, to Yerevan, uh, after visiting several uh, cities, uh, he had gathered a huge crowd around himself and had managed to galvanize public opinion um, and tap into something that uh, a lot of us didn't see existed there. Okay, Philip, let me ask you, I mean, is Armenia really as unpredictable as it seems from the outside? Yeah, I was an early supporter of the movement. I believed that they can mobilize people. I did not believe, to be fair, that they'll succeed so quickly. I thought it will take another round and maybe it will last until the next uh, elections. But I believed in the popular mobilization behind this young and progressive movement that was registering progress uh, a few years now. This wasn't really the first mobilization. It was the first one so clearly led by Pashinyan. Uh, but there were a few mobilizations on social causes uh, by, led by young people. And this movement also was led uh, heavily by young people, and Pashinyan uh, turned out to be the leader. But he wasn't the only leader, especially in the early days. He was the one who walked alone from one side of the Armenia to the other. At the same time, there were uh, other groups mobilizing in Yerevan. They joined forces with Pashinyan as he arrived to Yerevan. So I was expecting a big mobilization. I wasn't expecting a, a quick resignation by Sarkisian. Okay. Uh, I think it was very predictable uh, that this, this regime cannot last too long. Levon, it is a young and progressive movement. It's also very untested. We know Armenians want change, but they really are, in a sense, entering the unknown here. Do you think the country is ready for this? Absolutely. I, I think you, you have to give credit to these young people. This is the f generation that has grown up after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So this is basically a generation that has grown up uh, in independent Armenia that hasn't, doesn't have the same complexes, the, um, you know, the same difficulties their parents had experienced. Uh, it's a much freer uh, generation, despite Armenia being, you know, semi-authoritarian country in the past uh, decade. Uh, it, it is a country that has uh, quite a vibrant uh, um, media scene. It has a, it's a country that has a very vibrant cultural scene. So uh, there is a lot of internal resource for uh, this kind of liberal um, movement that, you know, 
attracted uh, the youth. I, I mean, this, this is a generation of Twitter and Instagram. They see what's going on in other countries. They have mastered these uh, communications tools and uh, they're ready to mobilize. And I see a lot of parallels uh, to <coughs> what happened in 1998 when the Karabakh movement was, you know, began and was driven mostly again by uh, the young people of my generation. Okay. Uh, Richard Garagosian, I mean, let me ask you your perspective on this. So as we said, it's, it's a young and progressive movement, but it's not been tested before. Uh, do you think it's good for Armenia to go forward with something they really haven't tried, or should this youth be really careful what they wish for here? No, I think the period of caution or careful consideration has passed. This is an accumulation of vibrant discontent. But this is a wave of activism, very much in a positive way. More importantly, this was a rare example of a victory by nonviolent, peaceful demonstrators against a rather corrupt, entrenched elite. Therefore, the momentum remains on the side of the youth. More importantly, what we see is, like Armenia at the independence during the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was no preparation then either. In fact, Armenia started two steps behind everyone else. The end was at war over Nagorno-Karabakh. In this context, it is overwhelmingly positive. And just the fact that we're making okay. news in Montreal and Washington is significant. Uh, Richard, I mean, I love your upbeat tone now, but we spoke earlier uh, when we debated this prior to the resignation of Serge Sarkisian that there was a genuine lack of political alternatives. And that's why you and our other panelists thought that nothing was going to change. Why is this suddenly safe territory to enter? Why is there so much confidence now that there will be good enough people to take the lead in a new government? For two reasons in particular. First is the ruling elite. The Republican Party and its leadership is now so deeply discredited that there is a new fresh opportunity for more of a consensus coalition, much more technocratic and much more professional. In, in fact, all day in Armenia today, there was an example of a parliament for the first time ever fulfilling the role of a parliament in a positive way with a policy debate, in a negative way, a partisan posturing, challenging the opposition leader, Pashinyan, who's now the only candidate to become the interim premier and then to oversee extraordinary new elections reflecting a new political reality. Hence, it's the new political reality okay. that justifies the optimism. Uh, Philip and, and Levon, I can see you both share that optimism. Philip, go ahead. On what grounds? Uh, uh, Armenia always had a pretty strong potential. It's a very well-educated uh, country, uh, especially the young people who have been leading the movement. They didn't have the interest or the opportunity to participate in governance, uh, but they are clearly making a step forward. And even within the lower ranks uh, of the uh, current government, uh, there are a lot of young, bright people uh, ready and willing to continue who weren't necessarily associated with the regime. So there doesn't need to be any kind of a major change of uh, overhaul of everybody. The top leadership uh, needs to change. Uh, and from there on, there can be a lot of uh, continuity in a positive sense and uh, change uh, of uh, the institutions that were corrupt and, uh, frankly, colonial. So there is, I see, a big wave of decolonization happening in an institutional sense, uh, specifically because the generation leading the charge right now is a post-Soviet generation. Okay. Uh, Levon, let me ask you, I mean, at risk potentially right now through this change in government is Armenia's relationship with Russia. It's one that is very strong. Uh, you can call it, as some have insinuated, somewhat colonial. But it is, at present, Armenia's strongest ally and partner. Is, is Armenia prepared to risk that relationship? Or, in your opinion, is it a good thing to put that relationship uh, in a different space? I, I think you should. Uh, I was very encouraged by Pashinyan's remarks uh, uh, during the press conference he held with foreign reporters. Um, specifically mentioning that this, uh, he is not going to make any sudden geopolitical moves, that this movement is really a, a pan-Armenian movement, an interior movement that doesn't challenge the geopolitical order, 
uh, in, in the region. And I think he has been on the record opposing uh, some of the pro-Russian policies of uh, the previous government, but he has also come out and said that he is willing to be quite pragmatic, that this agreement, uh, the defense agreement, the economic agreement is already there and he is going to work to uh, make them work for Armenia better than uh, the previous government had. So I think those are very encouraging signs for me, showing that he's not just a revolutionary, that he can be quite pragmatic, that, you know, with all the populism he has been uh, channeling through, he there is a pragmatist streak in him, and he is not going to rock the boat, at least for now. And I think the reaction of Russian authorities so far uh, the, the fact that you didn't even hear the term color re revolution applied to Armenia speaks to the fact that they are not worried about some kind of a sudden uh, Ukraine-like uh, geopolitical shift in Armenia. And uh, I think they've been quite wise because uh, there is really not a lot of um, anti-Russian sentiment in Armenia. There is some uh, resentment about the country's dependence on Russia for everything from defense to economy. Uh, there, uh, but I think a lot of people realize that for now, it's uh, and for the foreseeable future, it's a geopolitical okay. necessity. Having uh, Russia and, and Russian military bases uh, is not going to change in the next at least uh, five to ten years. Okay, so um, Richard, Armenia is not Ukraine. Pashinyan is not the Zakashvili of Georgia. And this revolution or uprising will not be the Tahrir Square we saw in Egypt that arguably produced results that most of the participants in the Tahrir Square uprising were rather unhappy with. Armenia is different. Well, yes, clearly. What we also see is much of the protests were overwhelmingly domestic in nature. Therefore, the continued reforms and changes to come will also similarly be domestic in nature. And to be honest, Armenia is too small to fail, meaning that it doesn't really take many and it doesn't take much for real sustainable development and change. Okay, Philip, uh, just down to our last minutes, I'll give you some final thoughts. Uh, I uh, fully support uh, what I heard. I think Russia also behaved very well and perhaps a lesson learned from Ukraine because uh, apart from all the gains that uh, Russia registered, it also lost the uh, entire Ukraine and Georgia. And I think these are the lessons learned and Russia didn't want to lose Armenia. Uh, I see actually a lot of positive uh, coming uh, uh, in the future because this is now legitimate new government, hopefully soon, taking charge in Armenia. And it can be a new beginning for relationships uh, with Russia on a more equal footing, but also with uh, Turkey, with Azerbaijan, and with the rest of the neighborhood as well. So I'm quite optimistic looking forward. Okay. I'm, I must say I'm so glad to see the sense of, of optimism uh, between the three of you there. We're going to have to leave it uh, for now, but I'd like to thank you so much for joining us all on this edition of the Newsmakers.